Hi, I'm Stephen Foster from Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I've been using Amnion since probably the, the mid-1990s, and uh, uh, that all came about as a consequence of Dr. Batier from, from uh, the Dominican Republic, and he started using it as a consequence of seeing what he thought was Amnion back in Russia in a time when uh, there was a lot of secrecy and they wouldn't really share with him what they were doing that was having good effects on uh, damaged and uh, uh, very unhealthy corneas, but he sorted it out on his, on his own and began doing that, and I learned that from him. And so for the longest time, I used Amnion that um, would come from generally one a year would do uh, me, it would last me a year. Someone who was having a cesarean section at the Mass General and would give permission to uh, take the placenta. My technician would take it from MGH down the hallway into the Mass Iron Infirmary in and, and a, a stainless steel tub covered with towels and then under the hood and dissect it into um, squares uh, and uh, put it on nitrocellulose filter paper in these probably two inch squares and then keep it in um, liquid nitrogen. Uh, it was tedious, it was annoying, but it was worth it because of the effects that it had on the kinds of corneas that I often deal with. And then little by little by little, I, I began to realize that one placenta a year wasn't lasting <clears throat> until one of my technicians told me, well, well, Dr. Foster, uh, Dr. Kenyon comes in here and takes Amnion from you. He said that you said it was okay. So you can imagine how thrilled I was when commercially available Amnion uh, came about. And this is the company that I'm in love with with respect to product because it doesn't require special storing, storage kinds of technique um, because it's lyophilized. So no more dealing with uh, freezers or refrigerators or um, uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, the place that you see mentioned there, Massachusetts Eye Research and Surgery Institution is uh, a, my own private institute that was created about seven and a half years ago after 30 years at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. So amniotic membrane is pretty remarkable stuff. It has been used since the earlier part of the 20th century by others for non-ophthalmic purposes to enhance certain kinds of wound healing. You see Juan's name underneath the photograph there. He's the guy that really deserves credit for bringing this utilization of this remarkable tissue uh, into the, to the Western world. It uh, is dissected off from placenta, and as you can see, the various layers of it here, it's been analyzed and found to contain a remarkable number of anti-inflammatory components anti-fibrotic or anti-scarring uh, materials uh, and uh, enhancement of epithelial migra migration materials as well. So I mentioned before that it had been used since the early part of the 20th century for non-eye purposes. The first uh, um, reference that we could find where someone used it for eye purposes was de Roth in 1940 and then subsequently others came along thereafter. I mentioned also the USSR doctors, specifically at the Fyodorov Institute in Moscow. <laughs> but it really was Batye who uh, brought it to the forefront here in the United States and, and um, the Central American and South American states. The Ambio Dry that we use is shown here, and it comes packaged, as you see there, sterile and not requiring special storage um, techniques. Doesn't have to be in the cold. It comes as two types, AMBIO2 and AMBIO5. The AMBIO5 is the newer of the two. I like them both, both for different purposes. I do routinely use it in all pterygium surgery. Whether or not I'm doing limbal stem cell grafting or mobilization of a, a piece of conjunctiva, it all gets covered up in the end by Ambio Dry. This is the newest kit on the block, and this is the most exciting 
thing that uh, I've seen in a long, long time. Whereas for a person who had <clears throat> um, six surface, and I was going to have to do a keratectomy and amniotic membrane graft, we would go to the operating room. And in the old days, suturing, but more recently, well, over the past five years or so, um, uh, tissue glue, tissue in, in particular. That's gone for me. As you'll see in a, a, a very short video, this is now uh, done in the, the office and you'll see that uh, momentarily. These are the kinds of people that I deal with predominantly. Those with neurotrophic, non-healing corneas, those with uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome and ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, and those with sick surface because of damage to the basement membrane zone. For example, those people with so-called, uh, in the old lingo, metaherpetic uh, corneal disease. The amniotic membrane, uh, allows us then to have that defect protected, of course, but also supplies to the surface growth factors and other cytokines that encourage epithelialization. Uh, the materials that exist are pretty legendary and uh, uh, extensive. You can see some of the things listed here, but it also does contain growth factors in addition to these uh, collagens and proteoglycans. I alluded to the cytokines <clears throat> responsible for diminishing inflammation and diminishing fibrosis. And then of course there are the growth factors like fibroblast growth factor and epidermal growth factor. The purion process that IOP ophthalmics uh, engages in, you can see here, um, highly safe, FDA approved and hence uh, on the market because of that with a five year shelf life. Notice that the analysis, it's not just my word for it, it really is scientific studies showing the presence of the various cytokines and growth factors in this product. The bottom line shows the check marks exactly like is present in the natural tissue that we used to harvest from cesarean section births. There is evidence also for suppression, not only of inflammatory responses, but also of immune responses, as you can see from the reference by Park and uh, Associates, immunosuppressive properties of dried amniotic membrane, published three years ago in ophthalmic research. They do promote cell growth and cell spreading and covering of persistent epithelial defects, and this has been true not just in uh, animal models, alkali burn animal models in particular, but also in the human circumstance. Here you can see another comparison between uh, Ambio Dry and another product which is uh, frozen and requires cold storage. Uh, the, the big, uh, from my standpoint, in terms of uh, user-friendly usage, of Amnion, uh, it is the storage that's the big deal for me. I don't know how many of you sitting here have a minus 80 degree freezer uh, on your, your ambulatory surgery unit. Certainly if you're in a hospital, you could probably get access to that. But I don't know many ambulatory AS ASCs uh, or um, office minor ORs that have that. Here's the, the new addition that I'm in love with. And the reason is because um, uh, with the use of uh, a contact lens, and the one that we like the most is from a company called Contour. We use a lot of contour lenses in my office because of the nature of my practice in the ocular surface disease and the Stevens-Johnson and pemphigoid patients. But um, one can take this disc, this ambio-dry disc, do an in-office um, debridement keratectomy if you wish. Uh, actually, Ken Kenyon invented, as far as I know, Ken invented the term um, uh, wex cell keratectomy, which basically means taking a dry wex cell and not just kind of gently brushing or rubbing like that, but taking it and using the dry edge of it to really get into 
uh, the cornea uh, down past uh, epithelial basement membrane. So wax cell keratectomy or otherwise, lay on the, the disc with the IOP looking at you just like it looks here and hydrate, smooth, put on the contact lens and you're done. No sutures, no glue, you're done. Persistent epithelial defects is the big one for me. And here you see a, probably a number 15 barred Parker blade being used for denuding uh, the epithelium. One does need to get past the damaged basement membrane. And so if you've got a non-healing defect that's five millimeters in diameter, probably ought to go on out to about eight millimeters in terms of the amount of denuded epithelium that one's going to cover. And then here it shows the disc going on to the uh, denuded uh, basement membrane. And um, the IOP should be looking at you. That's the correct orientation. Mostly, the hydration occurs simply from the tears on the ocular surface. We rarely have to add some BSS to the material. Um, 10 minutes if you're sort of slow. Hi, I'm Stephen Foster from Cambridge in Boston, Massachusetts. My institute, the Massachusetts Eye Research and Surgery Institution, is a freestanding private institution caring for patients predominantly with inflammatory eye disease of various sorts, including ocular surface disease. I've been using amniotic membrane for probably 20 years in my care of patients with certain ocular surface diseases, including neurotrophic keratopathy with failure for closure of epithelial defects. That's an example of the sort of thing that this lady that we're going to treat today has. In the old days, I would make my own amniotic membrane for ocular surface reconstruction, taking a placenta, one a year would typically last me, from uh, someone having a cesarean section at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Today, happily, we have preserved amnion, <laughs> including the product that is lyophilized and which is therefore incredibly user-friendly. Uh, the new product that I'm going to be employing today is married to a contour soft contact lens and therefore requires no tissue adhesive or sutures for application to the ocular surface. I intend to do the ocular surface uh, uh, debridement with a wex cell sponge doing a so-called wex cell keratectomy as opposed to a blade because the patient's ocular surface is so unhealthy the, uh, the material should come off very easily. After that I'll simply put on the amnion with contour lens and that should be the end of the whole procedure. The absorption is variable. The numbers shown here are, um, in my experience, a, a little short. Most of mine last a couple of weeks. But it does absorb. You don't have to do anything to take it off. You simply 
remove the contact lens when you're comfortable with the idea that the ocular surface is now healthy. This is a case that uh, John did for a person who had had prior treatment uh, of um, a melanoma with topical mitomycin C and a PED or persistent epithelial defect and uh, there that patient is 10 minutes after the application of the um, disc and two days later and nine days later and it's dissolving and you can tell that from the little white speckles and a month later so just to um, uh, refresh the memory about the differences between the dry product and the wet product and the lack of need of freezer, minus 80 freezer, not just any freezer, but a minus 80 for storage. And there's also a difference in cost. Reimbursement details are shown here. Pretty, uh, pretty generous reimbursement for uh, an in-office procedure that you, you just saw.